Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Some of you are struggling. You're thinking, Doug, I'd like to join the Remnant Church. I'd like to be baptized, but I'm not quite ready to give up my cigarettes. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee one day and the multitudes were following him. He saw four friends that were fishermen that were cleaning their nets. Andrew, Peter, his brother, and James and John. He asked if he could borrow Peter's boat so he could preach to the people without being crushed by the crowd off into the water. And Peter accommodated him. Jesus preached. Then afterward, he said, I see your boat is empty. Why don't you launch out into the deep and let down your nets? They said, Lord, you're a good preacher, probably a fine carpenter, but you don't know anything about fishing. You fish at night. We fished all night. We didn't catch anything. But if you insist, we'll try one more time. So they went out and they let their nets down. And the Bible tells us that the catch of fish was so enormous, the nets began to break. They had to call for their partners, James and John, to come along. And both boats were filled. They had never seen a catch like this at any time in their life. They knew it was a supernatural miracle. Peter, recognizing that he was in the presence of a divine being, fell down before the Lord and said, Lord, you don't know who I am. You better leave. I am a sinful man. You know, that's what the Lord wants us to do. Come and confess our weakness just like we are. Jesus said, don't fear, Peter. From now on, you are going to catch men. You can come with your gifts and your sin just like you are, and the Lord will train you to utilize your gifts in his service. The Bible tells us the night of the Last Supper, when Jesus notified them that tonight one of you is going to forsake me, or one of you is going to betray me, and you'll all forsake me. Peter said, though all these men forsake you, I will not forsake you, comparing himself among his friends. And they all said the same thing. Peter did not recognize his own weakness. He was sincere, but he did not know his own heart. I mean, later that night when Judas came with the mob, Peter pulled out his sword. He planned on fighting. You know why? His friends were watching. As long as he had an audience, Peter was very brave. <laughs> but shortly after that, when all of his friends forsook Jesus and fled... Peter wanted to follow Jesus, but now Jesus was not popular. So the Bible says in Mark chapter 14, he followed from a distance. He followed afar off. Friends, if you're going to follow Jesus, don't follow afar off. You want to be as close as you can possibly be. Otherwise, you may repeat the mistake of Peter if you follow Jesus from a distance. Let's find out what we can learn from God's Word about these principles by going to question number one. How does God determine whether or not we are on His side? Say the answers with me. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that talks about doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You know, Jesus says quite a bit about doing Christ talks about a father that had two sons, and he said, please go work in my field. And one son said, not today, Dad, I've got other plans. But he repented, and he later went. The other son said, I'm on my way, Dad, but he never went. And Jesus says the bottom line is, which of the two sons did what their father said? The one who had a pretense but didn't go, or the one who said no but then repented and went? The bottom line, Christ said, is the one who did it. The Lord wants us to be doers of the word. Amen? <laughs> Romans 6, 16. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves uh, servants, let me say that again. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We are ultimately the servants of the one we're obeying. If we are obeying the rules of a church, then you better hope that church has a heaven to take you to. If you want to get to heaven, you need to obey God. Amen? Amen. If you're obeying as a government instead of God, as some people have done, you better hope that government has a heaven to take you to. How do we best demonstrate our love for God? By honking your horn, right? Get one of those bumper stickers. If you love Jesus, honk. That means you love Jesus. 
No. John 8, 31. He says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And again, John 14, 15. The Lord tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. He wants us to keep them. 1 John 2, 4. He that says he knows him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, how many commandments would that be? All of them. Because it says in James 2.10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble or offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Now, we've learned during this seminar that God is looking for a people in the last days who have the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Do you, mean, do you think that means some of the commandments or all ten of them? God's law has not been abrogated. It has not been annulled. What Jesus wrote with his finger in stone is still intact. You will see it is in heaven someday. That's why he said heaven and earth must pass away before one jot or tittle in any wise passes from the law. And I make no apologies for teaching the commandments, including the Sabbath commandment, because Jesus told me that whosoever therefore shall break the least of these commandments and teach men so, Matthew chapter 5, he'll be spoken of as least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so I'm worried about what he thinks of me and not what the popular world thinks of me. Amen? So we've learned that there is at least one, and in some places several commandments that even Christians are turning away from. And it's a very critical thing to do. Will true Christianity be popular in the last days? Christ has warned us, if you want to be a real Christian, you need to brace yourself because you're going to meet with opposition. Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus said, you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Is he worth it, friends? That means that everywhere you go, if you really live the Christian life, you're going to meet with opposition because you will be a threat to the devil and he will oppose you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, but the devil will oppose you every step of the way. 2 Timothy 3.12, it says there, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, why don't we have more persecution in places like the United States? You know why? There's not very much godly living. Matter of fact, I've often wondered if we ought to pray for trial and persecution that it would stimulate some more godly living, right? We might be praying the wrong prayers. We're praying for peace and prosperity. We ought to say, Lord, send a famine. That's what Elijah did, and it brought a revival. Am I right? You start living godly, you'll see more persecution. If we would be more of a threat to the devil, the fires of persecution will be rekindled. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon, who's that? The devil was wroth, infuriated with the woman, and he goes to make war, that's the battle of Armageddon, with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. This is just on the horizon right over the next hill, friends. Furthermore, Revelation 13, 5, the Lord tells us in prophecy, the beast power will cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. I don't know what you think, but I think that's pretty serious. Now, you can expect that if you take your stand for the truth, people are going to call you a cult. They're going to call you bizarre. I, there's all kinds of strange rumors floating around out there. Seventh-day Adventists sacrifice chickens, and I don't know. You know, the people think that we have green antenna or something and don't know that we're just Bible-believing people. And uh, there'll be a lot of misconceptions. You will be falsely accused. You know, back in the days of Nero, Nero wanted to use the Christians as a scapegoat because the people were very dissatisfied with his government. So you know what he said? The Christians, during their communion service, they said, this grape juice and this bread is a symbol of the body and blood of Christ. Nero took that and said, Christians are cannibals. They go into the catacombs and they eat human flesh. And that spread all throughout Rome and that made them feel more justified when they saw the Christians being torn from limb to limb in the Colosseums because they said, well, they're, you know, they're cannibals. What do you expect? That wasn't true. The devil is a master of false advertising. Am, am I right? Is it possible to serve both God and the crowd? No, Jesus tells us very clearly, friends, what does it say? No man can serve two masters. You know, one time someone came to Benjamin Franklin. They asked him for a scripture that proved that a man could not have more than one wife. And he quoted this. No man can serve two masters. <laughs> no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one 
and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Now during World War II and World War I, Switzerland was neutral. They said, we don't want to get involved. We've got the banks. Be nice to us. And everyone left Switzerland alone. They were neutral territory. I've got some sad news for you. In the battle between Christ and Satan, there is no Switzerland. If you're not with him, you are on the devil's side, friends. If you're not on the winning team, you're on the losing team. There's no middle ground. And you might say, well, I don't want to make a decision right now. By saying I don't want to make a decision now, you're making a decision. You're staying on the devil's side, and you make yourself an adversary of the one who died to save you. Matthew 13, 20, Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. Those are our choices, friends. We are with Christ or against Christ. And after all he's done to save me, I don't want to be against him. Is it safe to love friend or family member more than Jesus? No, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, what is Christ saying? Is he telling us we're not supposed to love our children? No, we're supposed to love him supremely more. Luke 14, 26. If any man comes to me and hate not, and that word hate there means to love less dearly, his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and his sisters, yea, his own life also cannot be my disciple. We need to love the gift, or the giver more than the gift. Am I right? Some people think, well, Doug, I want to take a stand. I want to join the remnant church. I want to be baptized, but... I'm waiting for my family. I, they need time to adjust and to accept. I'm waiting for my husband, my wife to come along. The best thing you can do for the ones you love is to put God first. Because if you procrastinate, you're sending a message to them that it's really not that urgent. It's not that important. If you want to really show love for your children, then you put Christ first. You sense the urgency. They will sense that. Whatever decisions you make will ultimately react in those around you. You're going to take people to heaven or to hell with you by your example, friends. And it's so much more important that you love the one who gave you your children, your spouse, your family, than loving them supremely. Some of you are struggling. You're thinking, Doug, I'd like to join the remnant church. I'd like to be baptized, but I'm not quite ready to give up my cigarettes. That's right. There's some people. They'd rather have a filter king than the king of kings. Some people would rather have a string of pearls than the pearl of great price. Amen? A lot of people are willing to sacrifice eternal life. They're not willing to cut. Some people are saying, Doug, I'd like to follow you, but God knows I need to take care of my family. And if I keep the Sabbath truth, I'm going to lose my job. Well, pardon me, friends. I know that's difficult. I've been there and been through that. But you're going to meet people in heaven who lost their lives rather than disobey Jesus. We need to love him so much because he laid down his life to cover our disobedience. Will we continue in sin, knowing that it grieves him, that it wounds him? If you love him, you must be willing to make any sacrifice, and you will be blessed if you do. Don't forget that. The blessing outweighs the sacrifice. Is it wise to put a prosperous career or earthly treasures before Jesus? What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 26, verse, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 16 Verse 26, for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? A lot of my immediate family thinks I'm stark raving mad because my father is virtually a billionaire living in Miami and uh, I'm bebopping around the country preaching and I get a pastor's salary. And they said, you know, you need to be down there. You need to be working for him. You need to be close and think of how you can help God's work. A lot of people, Christians tell me, you ought to go work for your dad for a few years. And when you get a few million dollars, then you can help God's work. And you can help my ministry. They'll say, that's right. I know that God's called me to preach the gospel. Yeah, if I do that, I know my weaknesses. I would be lost. I'm not bragging about it, but I could not live in that environment. One way that I stay close to the Lord is I stay actively engaged in sharing Jesus with others. I'm doing this partly for selfish reasons, friends. It keeps me in the Word. It keeps me close. And it's invigorating for me to see people come to the Lord. I'm a mess just like you. This is just my calling. And by God's grace, I love preaching because I do it anyway. They pay me for it. <laughs> Number Luke 12, 15. 
The Bible says a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. You know, my heart yearns over a lot of our young people. I visit at the schools and I say, what are your plans? And so many of the young people, even at Christian schools, their plans revolve around what career is going to pay the best. Instead of saying, how can I best serve God and my fellow man, which used to be the pattern, now they want to know what will have the best job opportunities, the best retirement, what will give me the quickest raises and most power to buy a new ha house and a fancy car. And, and oh, I think these, they don't know. I've been there and done that too. And happiness does not come from the abundance of things. Happiness comes from knowing that you're on your way to glory, that you're going to live forever, that there's a plan for your life. Because you ask these people with all these possessions. I know some that have killed themselves. It doesn't bring happiness. You know, when I lived in Florida, they have greyhound races there. And uh, one day I heard a story that during a race, you know, they open the hatch and these dogs are trained all their lives to follow after a mechanical bunny rabbit. They're never intended to catch it. And they run with all their heart and soul to catch this mechanical rabbit. One day, it had rained at one of these tracks there in Florida, and the grass was laying across this little electric track where the electrical bunny runs on a rail. Halfway through the race, everybody's cheering, and the dogs are yapping full bore. The rabbit went across this wet grass, and it caused a short, and the bunny blew up. And all these poor, skinny little anorexic greyhounds were wandering around nervously because they lost their goal. They didn't know what to do anymore. Some people spend their whole lives chasing after these dreams that they're never going to attain because happiness doesn't consist. As soon as you think you've got everything, you'll find out you don't. And you'll want that, and you're dissatisfied. I also heard about a greyhound race one time where a real rabbit bounded across the track, and one dog looked at the mechanical rabbit. He looked at the real one. He said, forget that. And he went off <laughs> after the real rabbit. Never saw him again. Is it safe to continue disobeying God's will after he's shown us the truth? Very disastrous, friends. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, wait, you're thinking that doesn't sound fair. Keep reading. Not just because of lack of knowledge, but because you have rejected the knowledge. Oh, my heart is yearning over people who've sat night after night in the seminar. You've heard the truth, and you're holding off. The Bible says if you reject knowledge... I will also reject thee. Seeing that you have forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. It will not only affect you, it will affect those around you. Friends, for your sake, for the sake of God's glory, for your loved ones, surrender to Jesus and follow him. Don't follow the crowd. Don't worry about pleasing the world. The world is not going to make you happy anyway. Hebrews 10 verse 26. For if we continue to sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins that's why it's so important that we do something about what we've learned what will happen to those who persist in rejecting the truth it's very devastating the answer is second thessalonians 2 10 to 12 and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. Now, wait a second. What's one of Jesus' names? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you need to receive a love of the truth. When you love Jesus, obeying his word will be so much easier. That they might be saved. And for this cause, because they do not receive a love of the truth, for this cause, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. Are you aware that people in the last days who persecute God's children will ultimately get to the place where they're very sincere because they've rejected the truth, they will become convinced that the lie is genuine. You've met those people before, haven't you? They're very sincere that these ridiculous theories are true and they think their sincerity makes them true. John 3:19. It tells us, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because Abel was bad or because Cain was evil? Why did the religious leaders crucify Jesus? Because of Jesus' badness or because of his goodness? The light of his goodness made the darkness of their badness stand out in stark contrast and it convicted them. So they needed to put out the light. 
and that's why they crucified Christ. Is it safe to procrastinate or postpone this decision to follow Jesus? Hebrews 4, verse 7. Today, if you will, hear his voice. Harden not your hearts. Hebrews 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may have heard that story about the parable where the devil gathers all of his demons and they come before him. He says, I need some effective plot to ensnare human beings. And one demon jumped up and he said, tell them the Bible's not true. The devil said, oh, we've done that. It's got limited success. Something better. Another demon jumped up and said, tell them there's no God. The devil said, well, I've tried that too, but there's so much evidence of God. Another demon jumped up and said, tell them God doesn't care about them. They've gone too far. The devil said, that works too, but I need, I need something great. One by one they came, and then finally a demon with a diabolical grin said, Lucifer, I've got it. Tell them there's a God. Tell them to go to church. Tell them that the Lord loves them. Tell them to give their hearts to the Lord tomorrow. Don't do anything right now. They've got plenty of time. And as the legend goes, satanic smile snarled a crown around the devil's face, and he said, that's it. And that is going to be the design that will fill hell to bursting capacity, friends. Procrastination. Now, if God is speaking to you, do not wait until the intensity of the spirit from this meeting disappears. Make your decision now, friends. Amen? What benefits come as a result of accepting and following the truth? Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing will offend them. Then in Job 8, verse 32, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And then 1 Peter 1, 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. You'll be free. You'll have peace for all these things. What question did Jesus ask Peter three times? John 21, 17, he said unto them the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? What needs to be the motive, friends? It needs to be because we love the Lord. Story I like to share about a father who was sailing through the warm Caribbean water with his two teenage boys. And one day he told them, be careful not to play near the edge of the boat. We're going through some shark-infested waters. Well, the boys soon fought, forgot what their father had warned them. They began to wrestle and chase each other around the boat. One began to lose his balance. He grabbed his brother's T-shirt, and they both fell off into the warm Caribbean water as the boat slipped on by. They were good swimmers. They began to shout for their dad, who came up below the deck, and he saw that the boat was leaving his sons behind. He dropped the sail, and he encouraged them to swim back to the boat. Well, they were out there blaming each other and dunking each other. And then the father noticed dark shadows beneath the surface beginning to circle his sons. And the father said, boys, I see sharks. Swim quickly and calmly back to the boat. Well, they looked around and they saw no dorsal fins cutting the water. They'd watched too much TV. One of the brothers said, I haven't seen these sharks in days. Dad's trying to scare us to teach us a lesson. So they said, shark, shark, help. And they began to mock their father. They continued to splash and to wrestle to show they weren't afraid. And the sharks continued to close their circle. The father understands the nature of sharks. And he told those boys, now, now, come to the boat. They hesitated. He threw them a life preserver. They said, we don't need that, Dad. We can get there on our own. Finally, in a def desperate effort to save the boys, the father took a knife from the galley. He cut his wrists. He dove in the water. And he swam away from the boat. The water began to boil and churn red off in this other direction. And the question is, now that the father's given his life to create a means for the boys to get back to the boat, he's shown his love, what more can he do? If they choose to remain in the water, friends, my plea to you is that you'll make a decision right now to come to Jesus. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. I really believe the Bible was a fairy tale. I didn't understand a lot. Two things became very clear to me. 
One, I was a big sinner and that Jesus was a big savior. The Lord says, Doug, I've called you to preach the gospel. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at AmazingFacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents, Central Study Hour, Everlasting Gospel, Bible Answers Live, and Wonders in the Word. You'll also find a storehouse of biblical resources geared towards answering some of your most difficult questions. And our online Bible school is just a click away. One location, so many possibilities. AmazingFacts.org. Friends, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, the Bible states that no one can serve two masters. It's an impossibility to truly live a life of integrity while cheating on your taxes or making decisions that are morally questionable. Christianity is more than a weekend activity. It's a daily choice to do the right thing, even though everything around you might be crumbling. That's why we'd like to offer you this special book entitled Alone in the Crowd. Satan's attack on Christ Church and the family has intensified. This book will share some practical steps to help you have a joyful Christian life even though the world might be falling apart. So call our toll-free number and ask for offer number 714. Or if you prefer, you can visit our website at www.amazingfacts.org. You can still write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 714, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. We pray this edition of Amazing Facts Presents has blessed you. So until we meet again, remember the encouraging words of Jesus, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. 